So as we start looking at the causes of conflict in the international system, um, I think it's important to understand one of the foundational ways that political scientists think about um, the causes of conflict and why states end up fighting. Um, and this is something that was put forward by Robert Jervis in his discussion of perception and misperception in the international system and the idea of spiral models toward conflict versus um, deterrence models toward conflict and how they can kind of be difficult to distinguish which situation you're in. Uh, and all of this is really resting on this idea that Goldstein Pivas talk about, which is that states are fighting oftentimes over specific interests, right? Sometimes that's control over governments or over policies. You know, states might um, seek to topple regimes that they find hostile. Um, they might try to, you know, uh, go after states that are developing nuclear weapons or supporting terrorism. Maybe there's economic issues. Um, People will talk about getting access to markets, um, much uh, less common today, but but quite common. You know, 150 years ago, was using military force to ensure payment of debts. Um, uh, today we rarely see that, uh, but it was not uncommon for uh, militaries to attack other countries, march on their treasury, and and loot the treasury to get you know debts paid. Uh, versus you know what's more common today is using military force to suppress illicit economic activity drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, the slave trade was uh, suppressed by the British Navy, those sorts of things um, we do see states using military force for, but those are all fairly rare. The vast majority of conflicts, about 90% of conflicts between countries, um, tend to have some sort of territorial component. Um, territorial disputes are, are far and away the most uh, common source of conflict or, or driver of conflict uh, between states. So much so that we even have a term for it. Um, irredentism is a desire to redraw a state's territorial borders. Um, this has historically been very common, but in the modern era, it's been um, far less common. Certainly since the end of World War II, um, there have only been a handful of territorial changes by military force. Um, China took a, a sliver of territory from um, India uh, in 1965. China took Tibet. Um, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and, and carved off a chunk of territory with Crimea. Um, most recently, Russia invaded Ukraine, carved off a chunk of territory um, in the east. Um, Israel uh, took territory from Jordan and Egypt uh, during the 67 war. Uh, but that's about it. There's not a lot of additional examples of states uh, tearing off territory from their neighbors and being able to hold it. And even in situations where they have been able to tear off territory and hold it, um, it hasn't always been easy uh, in the long term. Israel is, is still struggling um, with uh, resistance groups in, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, pushing back against Israeli occupation. Um, so difficult. Uh, occasionally you'll get states in trying to encourage succession, um, trying to break other states apart by uh, helping rebels um, break a, a state in two. Um, another place where we see states potentially fighting is over control of uh, territorial waters. Um, and so under uh, UN rules governing sort of access to ocean uh, waterways, uh, states can claim, claim up to about 12 miles off their coast as their immediate territorial waters. And what that means is that that's territory that you can control and treat as your own sovereign territory. And you can control who goes into and out of that territory because you have a security interest in that, that region. Um, but in terms of international trade and, and using international waterways, that's very impractical. And so there's this other... Um, distinction of exclusive economic zones, which extend, extend out about 200 miles from shore, in which states can claim that as their territory in which they're able to fish, they're able to mine, they're able to exploit economically, but it's open for transit. And so others can come into and out of that, that uh, exclusive economic zone. It doesn't get treated as um, sovereign territorial waters. And that seems fairly straightforward. And certainly if you think about, you know, the U.S. Uh, the U.S.'s borders, it's its pretty straightforward because the U.S.'s borders are relatively, um, our coastline is, is relatively um, you know, open facing out to the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Um, but in other parts of the world, um, there's peninsulas and islands and things get messy. For example, um, in the South China Sea, uh, where things are, are particularly messy, um, in part because um, you have a lot of different islands and, and, um, and peninsulas 
but also because you have disagreement about whether or not the, that UN practice um, captured in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea really should hold. And so in particular, China has pressed back against um, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is represented by the dashed blue lines, which is the exclusive economic zones for all of these different countries, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, um, Vietnam. Uh, versus what China's claiming, um, which is the red line, which they're claiming as their territorial waters. So again, not just exclusive economic zones that, that China should be able to fish and um, explo exploit minerals in um, the South China Sea, but China's claiming that as their territorial waters that they control and have sovereign rights over and nobody can go into and out of that without um, consulting with China. Um, and so this has been a, a source of, of great tension um, in uh, in Southeast Asia uh, because China's pushing forward this claim um, and states have been rearming and building up their navies uh, to try to resist this. There are regular standoffs over um, islands or even areas that aren't necessarily islands, uh, sometimes just literally rocks. Um, the United States and the Philippines conduct joint uh, military operations, which makes it sound very dramatic, but it, it oftentimes involves um, floating out to a rock um, in, a, in a boat that seats, you know, a, a couple folks and deflating the boat on top of the rock and basically just parking it there and waiting to hold that rock against um, uh, a Chinese attempt to park themselves on that rock because these are symbolic ways of claiming sovereignty and claiming control of the territory and cementing um, in uh, this dispute, right? So a lot of times these are the kind of conflicts that we see in, in the modern era over territory. Um, and the question becomes, so how do, how do you respond when countries make claims about this is how we have been dealing with things, this is a, a new request for something different, and there are, are two different um, stories we could tell um, based on whether or not you think a country is a status quo power or whether they're a revisionist power. And so if a country is a status quo power, that means they really do like the existing or international order. They like the way things are. They're not looking to upend the entire system, but they may have very specific and very limited concerns or grievances and things that they want to change. But those, those demands are limited. Um, and so if you are facing down a status quo power, ideally, right, the status quo power will, will make a request for an accommodation, say there's something I don't like about the international system that I'd like changed, I want this adjustment to the way that things work. Um, and others would look at that and say, yes, that's reasonable and we can accommodate you. And then everybody sort of works together and grievances get dealt with and relationships are strengthened and there's a sense of like, I can advance my interests by international cooperation. Um, and that would, in theory, put us on a track toward not conflict. Um, but sometimes you get a, a different reaction, um, what's sometimes called the spiral model, in that it's spiraling towards conflict in which the status quo power makes a request for accommodation um, and others decline. They say, no, we're not going to work with you on that. And as a result, the status quo power feels aggrieved. It feels that it's not able to use diplomacy and negotiation to address legitimate concerns that it has, and it's going to look for a non-diplomatic path forward. It may look to militarize, it may look to press its advantage, it may look to actually achieve that change with, um, with military force. And so the, the concern is that you're in a situation where you could have resolved that problem um, by working with the state and cooperating and negotiating and conceding maybe even, and because you didn't handle it that way, it ends up escalating toward conflict. Um, and that maybe seems not all that surprising, but I think when we juxtapose it against um, the deterrence model, we see sort of the, the, the rub of, of thinking about the international system and how to respond to requests for changes. And so um, requests for changes aren't always made by status quo powers. Sometimes they're, well, oftentimes they're made by revisionist powers that have many things that they want to see upended about the international system. In fact, they may want to to get the maximum possible they can out of the international system. Um, and as they're accommodated more, their demands are going to grow and increase. And so if that's the kind of situation you're facing, if you're facing, you know, Hitler um, in you know, 1939, who's, you know, 
militarized the Rhineland and has done the Anschluss with Austria and is making a demand on Czechoslovakia, you can't accommodate by you know providing territory from Czechoslovakia because he'll just take the rest of Czechoslovakia and then he'll roll into Poland, right? He's the, the limits to his demands just will keep growing. Um, Ideally, if you're facing down that kind of a situation, the revisionist state makes a request um, for an accommodation. Others um, recognize that that request is not legitimate, that this is probing, um, this is testing their resolve, and they stand firm against that, that um, request or that demand. Um, and the revisionist state realizes that if, if it goes down this pathway, if it continues pressing, there's gonna be conflict and it backs down in the face of, of stern resistance. Um, so essentially the ideal situation is you do the exact opposite <laughs> of what you do when you're dealing with um, a status quo state. Um, rather than accommodate, you, you stand firm. Um, the problem with this is that um, you might be responding to those requests as if you were dealing with a um, status quo power, in which case you, the revisionist state makes a request and you accommodate because that's what you do. You want to work with countries and help them achieve their um, their basic sense of security within the system for the stability of the system. Um, but others see that that request um, being accommodated, and they make additional requests. They're emboldened, and the requests keep getting bigger and bigger, and eventually you have conflict. And so we're left at sort of an impasse. Right? When states make claims to redraw um, the map or uh, make claims to change the way international law works to greater favor them, is the best strategy to accommodate that and try to work with that? Or is the best strategy to stand firm um, and, and um, respond? And both strategies can work. Um, both strategies can lead to conflict, right? If you attempt to stand firm against a status quo state, you are risking the spiral model and turning them against you. If you uh, appease uh, and accommodate a revisionist state, you are emboldening them to make additional um, demands and we're into that deterrence model toward conflict. Um, and so it, the, the story really hinges about how you respond to these things based on whether or not the state you are, are dealing with and interacting with is a revisionist state. And so how do we determine if a state is a revisionist state? And the conclusion that, that Jervis comes to in perception and misperception is that it's really hard. It's really hard because revisionist states will oftentimes mask their claims in terms of very reasonable status quo oriented language. So Hitler doesn't make the claim of I'm going to conquer the world. Um, he initially frames his his demands as very reasonable, as very limited about unifying German speaking areas and historically German um, territories that wouldn't have any implications for the eastern part of Czechoslovakia or for Poland or certainly not for France or for Russia even though those were his larger ambitions and, and, and where he was thinking, he framed his, his request as a revisionist state would frame the request. So it's hard to know because people can lie. Uh, but Jervis goes a step beyond that and says, it's hard to know because we're kind of stuck in our own heads. That our actions are oftentimes obvious to us. Our motives are oftentimes obvious to us. And we oftentimes give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and assume that other people also are giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Um, my motives are good. I know my motives are good. Obviously they're good. Of course you would recognize them as good. But other people don't have access to our thoughts and they don't automatically recognize our actions or our thoughts or our motives as good or beneficent. beneficent. So it can be really hard to get inside um, somebody else's head and because we're stuck in our own head and we don't understand how they perceive us. Um, we, we oftentimes misjudge situations. We also have a hard time um, fully appreciating the various different domestic pressures um, that other countries might be facing um, that might be driving them, that we might um, have a hard time understanding sort of their longer term in, in ambitions or, or even just how they understand their place in the world in terms of security. And because we don't necessarily have that ability to, to see the world through somebody else's eyes, it can be really hard to assess whether somebody is 
um, making reasonable claims or not reasonable claims, whether they're, they're a revisionist state or whether they're a status quo state. And Jervis says that this is a, a big source of conflict in the international system because we just don't know how to respond appropriately <laughs> to requests for change. And as a result, we end up either finding ourselves in a spiral model or deterrence model kind of situation headed toward conflict.